On the 3rd of March, 1662, Samuel Pepys wrote in his diary, I am told this day that Parliament hath voted two shillings per annum for every chimney in England. He called it a constant revenue forever for the Crown, and indeed the half tax lasted for more than 25 years, being collected on Lady Day and at Michaelmas, from 1662 to 1689, when King William III saw that abolishing it would be a popular move. Talk Genealogy, the podcast for genealogists with too much time on their hands. Here's your presenter, Malcolm Noble. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to episode 13 of the Talk Genealogy podcast, the podcast for the genealogists with too much time on their hands. This evening, it's the half tax returns. There are several very good online resources for studying the half tax, and I shall be recommending them as we go along. So in this podcast, while I want to begin with just a brief introduction about their scope and history, their detail if you like, I then want to offer a really good look at how the surviving returns can be useful for the family historian. But first, I need to remind you, as always, I'm neither a professional nor an expert. I'm an enthusiast like you, who has spent more than 50 years digging up his family tree. And these podcasts are really no more than me sharing with you some of the lessons that I've learned. I need to emphasise that I am talking about ancestor hunting in England. Always a romantic, I would like to start by reading Reverend S.H.A. Hervey's opening paragraph to his edition of the Suffolk uh, Half Tax Returns, a volume first published in 1905. He wrote, This volume carries us into every town, village and hamlet in Suffolk in 1674, sets us down at the door of each house, gives us the name of the occupier and tells us how many fires he had in his house. It is a complete directory for Suffolk in the 17th century, completer far than any that Kelly or White gave us for the reign of Queen Victoria. The names of those who were exempted from paying rates by reason of the poverty are given as well as the names of those who had to pay the great mansion containing from 20 to 50 halves, the small squire's house containing 10 to 20, the parsonages and the yeoman's house containing six, more or less, the tottering cottages with only one. Here they are all set down together with those who were lucky or unlucky to warm or shiver within them. This volume will not tell us who's who, but it will tell us who's where and where's who, and that is often what we want to know. Hervey, by the way, was a hard-working genealogist, an example to us all, and I will provide a detailed profile of him in a future episode. In this passage, Hervey acknowledges the limitations of the returns. They are not a who's who. But he also signposts an early opportunity for what we might call social profiling, and that is an important tool for the genealogist. The half tax returns are important for their reach. They covered the whole country. Their depth, from the knights and baronets down to the pauper in his hovel, and their survival, a very good proportion have, against all the odds, come down to us. Their reach, their depth, and survival means that they are important tools in genealogy, population studies, social and local history. They are the closest source we have to a census of the 1670s. So perhaps we should wonder, why aren't we using them to the same extent? Let's take a look at them. When Charles II found himself short of money, he turned to his advisers for suggestions. A poll tax was disregarded, not because of its unfairness, the merry monarch was not that good-hearted, but more from the difficulty in tying people down. Collection would be difficult. However, one of those consulted was Sir William Petty, in some ways a controversial figure. History either lords him or damns him. I think he was an economist far ahead of his time. He developed early theories of money supply and the Lacey Fair doctrine. But he also offered astute arguments on how to manage the national purse. 
Petit had seen a half tax working effectively in France, and so in 1662 it was introduced on this side of the channel. Be it enacted that every owner or occupy of every such house shall, within six days after notice given him by constables, head borough, tithing men or other officers within whose precincts the house shall be, deliver to them a just account in writing of all the hearth and stoves within the house. From the First Chimney Act of 1662. From the start it was unpopular. Three months after that first diary reference, Pepys was saying they clamour against the chimney money and say they will not pay it without force. In December 1667, there were half tax disturbances at Hereford. 30th of July 1668 saw disturbances in Norwich. But for all its unpopularity and the inevitable inconsistency which draws from even a simple tax, let's remember it survived for a generation as the main tax income apart from customs and excise. Indeed, some people did speak of it as an excise rather than direct taxation, property or wealth tax. They said it was simply a duty on chimneys, which of course it wasn't. Although it was known as a chimney tax and the collectors the chimney men, we must remember that it was a tax on hearths. A single chimney might rise from more than one hearth, remember. So what are we looking at? What are the details? A tax of two shillings was levied on every hearth. Working wages varied enormously around the country, from season to season, let alone year to year, but it's not too far out to consider that a labourer in the countryside might earn a shilling a day. So, twice a year, he was required to give up a day's wages as a duty on his single hearth. Initially, householders were required to offer some form of self-assessment, declaring the number of fire hearths and stoves. Private ovens and kilns were not taxed, but the poor old baker had to pay for each of his baker's ovens. It was the occupier who paid the tax. Thinking themselves clever, some occupiers might have sought to claim that part of their houses were unoccupied, divided off even. So the rules smartly clarified that owners became responsible for unoccupied dwellings. The self-declaration was eventually replaced and householders could look forward to a visit from the chimney men who had a right of entry during daylight. The collectors of the hearth money at Bridport were followed about the town by men, women and children who threw stones at them. There was little appearance of the magistrates to quell the disturbance. One Mr. Knight was hit in the head twice and has since died of his wounds. It is said that it was a planned plot. Anthony Thowold, Lyme, Dorset, 8th of February 1667. Generally speaking, and this is not without exceptions on either side, the poor were exempt if they were already receiving relief or if they occupied a property with a rateable value of less than 20 shillings a year. The poor were given exemption certificates and from 1663 should be listed in the returns, although exemptions do not always appear in the surviving returns. Generally, yes, but it's not reliable. Some people were considered so poor that they were simply ignored, so poor that nobody bothered to formally exempt them. If you like, they were too poor to count. When you hear of the grinding poor, this is the class that is referred to. Between 1662 and 1666, and between 1669 and 74, the returns were not only submitted to the quarter sessions, but were also audited by the Exchequer, and it is these records that survive, and through a rather tortuous route, can now be found in the National Archives. And here I want to recognise a slide presentation by Peter Seaman offered on the National Archives website. The link will be on the show notes and I'm relying on that excellent presentation for the next paragraph of my talk, looking at the survival of the returns. If I've got it wrong, then it's my fault, not his. By 1800, they were stored in the chests in the Palace of Westminster. 
but in 1822 their store was demolished in favour of new law courts and the records moved to a shed inside Westminster Hall. Slight and wooden, dark and damp. Worse, they were carried there loosely, sometimes in sacks without supervision. The labourers were left to get on with it. Goodness knows what damage was done and losses incurred during that move. In 1831, the law courts were expanding again, so the half-tax returns were removed from the shed to some stables. The great stables of the Royal Mews at Charing Cross. 4,000 cubic feet of records were thrown into two large bins. They were damp. Soon, some were beyond repair. We can picture the mess, can't we? The leaves of our history stuck and wedded to the bottom and sides of bins, all gooey. In 1833, record commissioners took over responsibility from the Exchequer for the safekeeping of the returns. In 1835, they were moved again, this time to some former stables at Carlton House in Pall Mall. Three workers shoveling the surviving records into sacks. It took them three weeks to fill 500 sacks. Things were improving, let's face it, they could hardly get worse, with the Public Records Act of 1838 and the formation of the Public Records Office. In 1858, the half tax returns were moved to the new building of the Public Records Office. But here I do want to stress that many local returns survive in county records offices, so please don't ignore them as a port of call. Now, the level of transcription has been pretty good. Throughout the latter half of the 19th and through the 20th centuries, something like 17 counties were published, giving the researcher at that time a roughly one in three chance of finding printed copies of the returns. Hervey gives us a glimpse of the difficulties that lay in store for the editors. He wrote, The printer has printed from my transcripts of Mr. Musket's transcripts of the original transcripts of the original returns. Therefore, this volume stands fifth in descent from those men who actually warmed themselves at these 60,000 hearths and growled at having to pay the king two shillings year by year for each of them. This index has been made in an amateurish sort of way, and I shudder when I think of the number of names likely to be omitted from it. Having had 30,000 very small bits of paper about my room for some months, I cannot help thinking that some of them must have been lost before their time. Besides, I am not altogether satisfied with the principles on which it has been made. In fact, I scarcely know what those principles are. Well, in spite of his reservations, I, for one, am very grateful for the several volumes of different aspects of family history that Hervey produced. The British Record Society is producing a uniform edition in conjunction with county record societies and the Hearth Tax Centre at uh, Surrey Roehampton University. They aim to publish a return for at least one year in each of the counties where early editions have not yet been published. The series is marching along well and will provide a truly excellent resource when this series is complete. I'll provide a link to the BRS Half Tax page on the show notes so that you can see which counties have already been published. And at this point I also want to recommend Half Tax Online run by the Roehampton Centre. This offers support that will interest the genealogist with too much time on their hands. Now let's have 20 seconds of music before we look at how we can use the half tax returns. Can I remind you that the show notes for this and previous episodes can be found on the website talkgenealogy.wordpress.com. That website includes a full bibliography of the books mentioned in this series and, of course, a complete listing of the episodes. You'll also find a wordy blog of my very occasional thoughts. Since tonight's podcast opens our second year of the Talk Genealogy podcast, sort of volume two, number one, I'd like to thank you for the support which you have shown. Our listening figures continue to grow. 
There's no science in this. I suppose I talk about what interests me and hope that it catches other enthusiasts. Now let's look at how genealogists can use the half tax returns. Of course, one of the first things you will do is to look for your ancestors' names in their home parishes. I guess that's how we'd all begin, and I don't want to discount the value of idle browsing. We are, after all, those genealogists with too much time on our hands, and browsing through the records and transcripts is one of the ways that enriches our hobby. I've had a copy of the Suffolk transcripts for some years, as you would be able to tell by the state of it. Yet I still take an hour here or there going through it, and while browsing, this time in another county, I recently came across a collateral family which had migrated to the next but one village. That is what started me working on that line, and I'm now hopeful of being able to connect it to another branch producing some sort of distant cousinship, but clearly this is the approach for obsessives only. Now, a first important tip. Our initial browsing might be more profitable, or at least more structured, if we noted down beforehand all the people that we expect to find in the transcripts, and then when we don't find them, we can start asking questions. So what could be the explanation if we know that a couple were having children in the parish but are not recorded in the half tax returns? The first step might be to look at a return for another year. You'd be unlucky if you didn't have some sort of choice. The first batch of reasons could be grouped under bad luck for the family tree digger. The surviving return could be damaged and names lost. The transcript could be wrong. The tax could have been avoided or wrongly recorded especially where the exemptions are concerned. Or the family could have been one of those grindingly poor, which I mentioned above. The more interesting possibilities crop up when we remind ourselves that the tax was forced on the householders. It may be that your family was not the occupier. They could have been living with parents or in-laws, or, depending on the circumstances, with their employers. If our previous knowledge has been based largely on the register of baptisms, consider the possibility that the wife was living with her mother during the confinement and sometimes after, meaning that the children would not be baptised in the parish where they would eventually be raised. Now this is just one suggestion of course, but it shows a frame of mind that you need to adopt. Remember, we are always looking for unanswered questions, peculiarities. So, the half-tax returns can point us in the right direction when we consider where to search next. When we want to find any strays, when we want to track migration, but sooner or later, we're going to want to reach beyond the names. Initially, I would encourage you to study any previous analysis of the returns for the county that interests you. All published editions will have some sort of assessment or commentary as an introduction. The criteria of these analyses tend to pass in fashion, so don't be afraid to match any arguments against those put forward at a different time. Editors are likely to talk about population growth and migration, economic activity, and sooner or later, the social profile. My regular listeners will know the importance that I attach to social profiling. It is the first step on putting flesh on the bones of the characters in our pedigree, and it is the best guide towards future research. And, because I've said it all before, I won't emphasise it here, but the half-tax returns provide a rough and ready indicator to the wealth and standing, and always remember that they are no more than a rough and ready indicator, and so they lend themselves easily to social profiling. Let's look at some of the issues. When we look at the social profile in Suffolk and Cambridgeshire, and I've chosen those counties only because they are the area that I'm currently working on, we can compare three different historical assessments from the same region. Of course, the consideration may vary from place to place, but I hope that my example will get across the kind of issues that we need to debate. In 1682, 
looking for families who were likely to have a claim to bear arms in Cambridgeshire, the Visiting Herald looked first at householders with five hearths. This was his initial indication, his initial scope, if you like. Then, working at the turn of the 20th century in Suffolk, Hervey suggested that the yeoman and parson would probably have six, more or less, he says, with ten signifying a minor squire. Working a hundred years later, and looking at the neighbouring county of Cambridgeshire, Margaret Spufford suggests three to four for the yeoman, and five plus for the gentleman. Now the apparent variance has more to do about definition. The definition of a yeoman has always been difficult, and gentleman is very much a movable feast. But these figures illustrate the sort of game that we are in. You know, there's much to be gained by drawing up a half tax profile for the village of your ancestor and probably the neighbouring parishes. Does this suggest that one is more economically active than the other, more successful? Why is that? You are there to investigate. A next useful step is to build a half tax profile for your ancestors, probably across a number of parishes. In the past, where I have found, say, one family with one half and another branch with two or three, I have tagged the families that each have married into. This immediately brings home a richer concept of the family tree and might suggest some promising lines to concentrate on in the future. If you have the returns for more than one year, it is worth comparing how different branches of the family have moved in that time. Always try to uncover the reasons for upward and downward mobility. Look at trade patterns, seasons and the weather, a broader population drift. The hearth tax is a prime example of a source whose true value can only be recognised when it is used in conjunction with other sources. You have a name and a number of fireplaces. But to make best use of those facts, you need to employ them to qualify data from other sources. Here's an example. You hope to use the half tax return to identify either the house or the site of the house where your ancestor lived. I have to say, with all the help in the world, this remains a difficult task, but let's pursue it. Now, one of the disadvantages of the early half tax returns were that they were not recorded topographically, that is to say, from neighbour to neighbour. This improved in 1684, so a return from the last five years of the tax would be a great help. In these circumstances, you need to specify the location of one building, the parsonage, the manor house, the bakery, and work from there, drawing on the number of households between that a uh, significant building and your ancestors building but otherwise you might only have the name and the number of hearths so it is difficult to use the return to place our ancestors in the way that we will be guided by a census but that shouldn't discourage us from having a go you may be able to work out that your ancestors house was one of the 12 most significant for example from the number of hearths, though don't automatically relate half numbers to size. To go further, you need to search other sources, especially maps of the Restoration period, if they have survived. Descriptions in legal disputes can be especially helpful, as well as comment in wills. You need to explore the parish chest, don't you? Stuart enclosures were not as common as a later period, but will be a true treasure in this quest, if they are there to be found. Remember, the half tax returns relate to the parish, not just the village, and some of the farmhouses may have been quite outlying. Don't forget, by this stage, you are also in the business of eliminating those houses where your ancestor didn't live, narrowing down the field, if you like. You can see that by this example, the half tax return only comes into its own when it is used to help understand other information. 
Now, if your family lived in a one-hearth cottage and the return is before 1684, this becomes especially difficult. And perhaps the best you can hope for is to identify the areas of the parish where such cottages were built. Finally, I want to share with you the idea of a colleague who chose to draw a decorative map showing the distribution of her hearth tax ancestors as a colourful way of presenting her family history in Restoration times. Begin with the basic outline and then add further information as space allows. Now, there's a project for the dark winter evenings. It's a good job that you're a genealogist with too much time on your hands. You know that I'm always reluctant to spend money on my family history project. I'm always warning you that the wolves are out there, but now and again I do recommend a society or group that is worth looking at. I hope some of you joined the Pipe Roll Society when I mentioned it. And now the British Record Society does some truly excellent work. We all know that. But the annual subscription to the society is actually not too much at all, and it offers a good deal for a very good cause. I hope you'll take a look at the website and give it a few moments thought. Thank you for listening to episode 13 of the Talk Genealogy podcast. Please get in touch if you have any thoughts or comments or a family history story you'd like to tell. Can I remind you that the show notes for this episode can be found on talkgenealogy.wordpress.com along with links to the previous episodes. The favourites at the moment seem to be number one, working with Tudor Wills, number seven, Companions of the Conqueror, and the bonus episode which I address to American genealogists but the stats suggest are being accessed by as many enthusiasts in the UK. The next episode will be posted at 7.30pm UK time on the 3rd of September. My goodness me, that's my wedding anniversary. My thanks to Freeze Effects for the music, Emily Brooks for the voiceover, and thank you for listening. And so, from the middle of England, good night and God bless. <laughs>